This is the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast, session number 340, The Heart of a Teacher. Welcome to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast with Jason Lynette, your professional resource for hypnosis training and outstanding business success. Here's your host, Jason Lynette. I'm Jason Lynette, and let me tell you a little bit about, first of all, the inspiration for this week's episode. There's an opportunity that I open up inside of my business, which is that for the various events we have going on, coming up in October this year, 2021, we have at nearly the same time, Work Smart Hypnosis Live and Online, which is our certification program, as well as with Richard Nongard, I co-train the Train the Trainer program for the ICBCH, the International Certification Board of Coaches and Hypnotists. You can find the details for these events over at the show notes at worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash 340, 340. That'll make it easy to see both events. But I bring this up because I very often will open up my calendar and give people the opportunity to schedule time to chat directly with me, which I do that because, well, if you're looking at signing up for a big training event, you might have some questions and let's make the opportunity available For people to get their questions answered. There's a little bit of a self-serving reason that I do that, though, which is that it helps me to stay completely on track with what people's goals are, why people are signing up for events. And this better helps us to make the events better the more that we do them and custom design for the people who are actually going to be there in the room, whether it's in person or in the room, if it's an online interactive training event. And I bring this up because I was on the call with someone just a few days ago, and even though she's in a category, which some of you may be surprised, still signs up for the certification event that we offer. You see, about half of the people who sign up for WorkSmart Hypnosis Live and Online, they're brand new, and this is the first official training that they're doing. Meanwhile, the other half are kind of like this woman I'm telling you the story of, which is that they're already significantly trained. She's already out there seeing clients, and yet she feels stuck inside of rigid change protocols and scripted techniques and doesn't quite have the confidence to customize on the fly and work interactively with her client. And I consistently find, and this is the theme of this week's episode, that there's a bit of a dynamic shift that I put into the work that I do. And I I won't sit here and try to claim this is entirely original to me. It's something that a lot of us tend to say in this industry. But it came about from first a little bit of playfulness in language, that the more effective I become, the less it's about hypnotizing my client to produce a change. And instead, it's more about helping them to live hypnotically so that they can make the changes for themselves. So understand there's a few things that I say in my marketing, in my promotion, in the videos that are on my various websites, which I'll call it out first, begin to set the stage for who I'm going to be successful in helping, as well as respectfully pushing away the people that are perhaps not quite a fit for the style of work that I do, which it all kind of begins. And you may want to rewind back and listen to some of the dialogue I'm about to share with you. It all kind of begins with that mindset that this is a process that's not about what's wrong with you and how are we going to fix it. It's instead about what's great about you and how are we going to harness that and put that into use. So right there, it kind of presents a philosophy. It presents a mindset of the world around us from which now the change occurs naturally. Because yes, as many of us would often say, It's not about hypnotizing a change. It's about de-hypnotizing away the old problems that used to seem real. So this week's episode is all about kind of unpacking some of the strategies, some of the influential pro calls that I'll often use inside of the process, and really in some ways about how do we start to build that environment where now they're being welcomed into something where now their old challenge no longer stands the ground it once had and it just doesn't fit, it just doesn't belong, and now becomes so completely incongruent to go back to the old way of living. To give some credit where it's due, though this is a popular phrase, uh, in the financial world, 
there's uh, Dave Ramsey, who has the total money makeover, total debt makeover. It's all about helping people get out of debt. I personally didn't go through his program to then become uh, other than a mortgage debt free. But there's some things that he says in his programs, which let me call one thing out. He does have some other opinions, which he's very loud about. Uh, I'll set those off to the side. Uh, it's instead about this mindset around money. And it kind of fits for what it's worth into presuppositions about our business. I heard him once say that savings is not a financial problem. It's an emotional problem. And I had all these reasons as to why that wasn't yet true for me. But just like the NLP presuppositions, as soon as I stepped into the reality as if it were true... Well, we started socking away money for retirement, for savings, for the kids' college, and things became a lot easier because it turned out, yes, it was an emotional issue and not a financial issue. Though, of course, financial issues are going to be a part of that as well, too. I, I bring up Dave Ramsey here in this intro because this mindset that you should only ever work with an accountant or a lawyer or any other service-based profession that has the heart of a teacher first and the service provider second. If you're working with an accountant, which if you're in business, you absolutely should be. They are worth every expense and they will find deductions for you. Every government in the world will reward you for running your business like a business. Uh, so they're going to find opportunities for you. So yes, we should be paying our fair share of taxes, but let's not give them an unintended raise for things we didn't have to pay, mind you. Uh, and similar too, I've hired lawyers over the years to review contracts, to set up lease agreements, where now the office in Virginia is a rental property. And they were able to tweak my language in such a way that prevents challenges down the road. Now, they didn't just email me back a new Word document and say, use this one. They got on the call with me and for like an hour broke down exactly how and why and the legal requirements so that now if something would occur, here's the appropriate gray area in the contract so all parties are protected. And this is a mindset that really I've brought to the client work that I do. I have become, get ready for this phrase, I have become much more effective in the work that I do as it's now my responsibility to help my client to live hypnotically in such a way that their old perception of what used to be deemed reality doesn't stand anymore. So that's what this week's episode is all about. Some of the stories of creating this world where change is inevitable, where, as Michael Elner would say, where hope is realistic, and giving you some strategies as well as some mindset adjustments to let this become easier and more natural for you. If what you're about to listen to resonates with you, I'd love to spend more time with you. We can check out our next upcoming Work Smart Hypnosis live and online training. Yes, it's a certification event. However, as I've already mentioned, many people who go through the event already have significant training. In fact, we recently had someone go through the entire course who's already a working professional, who's already actually been on this podcast, uh, and actually then um, financed three family members to go through the training with him. It's now a family business, and I think that is absolutely phenomenal. Also, we've got the upcoming Train the Trainer. If you really do have the heart of a teacher, you ought to be teaching. And this is our greatest way to future-proof this incredible industry. You know, yes, there's some things around hypnotic training that are out there right now. And the strength of the ICBCH Train the Trainer program is the fact that we don't give you a rigid curriculum and tell you you have to teach this. Instead, for those of you that have already been working for quite some time and maybe even have a specialty you'd like to highlight, to learn the ways to custom design a course around what showcases your talents and skills, do a class, which is what, quite honestly, every hypnosis training should be now, emulates the work that you are actually doing with real people and doesn't just necessarily tell stories of what someone else told you 20 years ago. Did that hit home to a few of you? <laughs> so the opportunity to join one of the largest and fastest growing progressive organizations uh, with ongoing support. Stay tuned. We have some awesome announcements about our annual conference for the ICBCH coming up rather soon. Either way, go to the show notes for this episode, worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash 339. That'll bring you to the show notes. That'll give you links and details for both the upcoming certification event, as well as the Train the Trainer program. All these stories and insights set the stage for where we're going now. This is episode number 340, The Heart of a Teacher. Once again, 
This is a process that's not about what's wrong with you and how are we going to fix it. It's instead about what's great about you and how are we going to harness that and put that into use in such a way that you create your own change. Sound good? That's part of what usually kicks off how I personally work with my clients. Now, there's a little bit of an influential nuance inside of that, which is that of the tag question, that of the checkpoint, one of my automatic ones as a rather relatively auditory person is that of the sound good. But basically, as soon as and it's not that I'm trying to establish a yes set for eventual pacing and leading, it's instead I'm kind of bouncing a philosophy off of the person in front of me to see if the model of the world that I'm about to present inside of the session aligns with them and if that's going to become part of the change process. Because I'll call it out, hand up in the air telling the truth, there are people that I've said that to and that wasn't quite a fit for, uh, which would be a little bit of conscious noise that's possibly, you know, sort of marinating around in their minds as to I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, and doggone it, no one loves me. Uh, instead, how is it that we can get that foot in the door that this is about harnessing skills and harnessing abilities? Take note, too, for some of the categories that we work with, for some of the issues we help people to resolve they had the ability to before. They were already, if you work with athletes, people don't pick up a set of golf clubs and go, man, I need a hypnotist. They go another route first. You know, maybe they take some golf lessons. Maybe they watch some videos online. Maybe they set up a camera in their living room and film themselves to see what their form actually looks like. It's really once they get deeper into the skill, and perhaps, as it often is, something happens and that's why now they're doubting their abilities. Uh, I was chatting with someone the other day. We both actually work with a fair number of gymnasts uh, gymnast over the years. And I said, is this the pattern you keep running into? She was flipping confidently on a high beam for years, but then here came an injury. And now she's running that injury in the filter of her mind and why she's not doing this. He goes, wow, yeah, that's exactly it. So the opportunity where bouncing this idea off of someone in advance is what's going to tell me what aligns with their model of the world. I also tell them at the beginning of the process, the goal of this is to build independence within you rather than a dependence upon me. So I'm doing my work effectively if at some point I can look you in the eyes and smile and say, professionally speaking, I hope to never see you again. And let that actually be a relatively positive thing. And I, I usually get a smile when I say that. Uh, and that does set the stage for this moment of, let's call it graduation, where now they understand the how and the why of their change. And even better, they know how to strengthen it on their own, even long after working with me. This episode is going out just as audio as, as most of them do. But if you've seen some of the recent videos in my home office, there's the uh, the book bookcase on the wall behind me. There's a chair I got as an award from an organization years ago. There's a lamp, just because it looks cool. And there's a few items that are framed on the wall. And uh, with the camera that I'm now using, mind you, it kind of distorts the background, which is a cool sort of cinematic effect. And one of the images that's in the background is actually the poster of the movie Spaceballs which allowed me to now explain that. So mathematically speaking, Spaceballs is a far better movie than the Star Wars trilogy because it took three movies of Star Wars for Luke to realize he had the Force. Meanwhile, it took one movie of Spaceballs for Lone Star, the character played by Bill Pullman, to realize he already had the Schwartz because the power did not come from the ring. The ring was in a Cracker Jack box. He always had the skill. This is exactly the anecdotal evidence you expected to find inside of this week's professional hypnotic podcast episode. I bring this up because while I may not necessarily go off on the rant about the Mel Brooks movie with my clients, there's a principle I've talked about here on this podcast of the Schwartz principle, because that's what it was called in the movie, which would be this premise that the more you make use of this skill that I've taught you, the better it's going to work for you. And the better it works for you, the less you're going to need it as a technique because instead now this becomes this new normal, this new automatic response. Checkpoint. Makes sense. They go, yeah. So the beauty of this now becomes, I'm bringing my client further 
into the process. My client is now an interactive participant of it, and it's not just the hypnotist said I should listen to this audio every day for a week. It's instead, I've taught a set of skills, which again, let's not even build dependency upon techniques, let's build independence within the individual. So that now they understand there's this little, let's say, window, this tunnel of time where this technique is going to be beneficial to them. And it's not necessarily the game of, I do this now every day for the rest of my life. It's instead the technique is helping to transition a sequence in their thoughts so that now when they get to that place where the change is established, there eventually comes that place that we don't have to reinforce it. Heart of a teacher. Sometimes this brings about some provocative moments in my process. I'll occasionally have a client say, this is amazing. I haven't smoked in weeks. Should I book with you a six-month follow-up for this? And while yes, that might be good for business, while yes, that might be good for advancing the relationship, enhancing rapport, maybe even booking additional services if necessary, the best thing I can say to that client in that moment is to kind of cock my head to the side like the confused puppy dog and respond quizzically, why? I mean, you're not going to be smoking six months from now, so why do you need to be reminded of it? I mean, we could book the time if you want, uh, yet if you're not going to be doing it, why do you need to be reminded of the thing you're not doing anymore? And then I purposely go off on a bit of a tangent and I tell a story. There was a little girl by the name of Caroline who was a picky eater. And actually, oddly enough, now that I'm telling this, I'm realizing I have three stories about picky eaters who were 10 or 11 years old, all named Caroline. So if your daughter's name is Caroline, I know a guy who works with food issues. <laughs> so the situation was, though, in this one, uh, mom and dad were separated, yet mom and dad were both on board with daughter coming in and working on uh, the sort of food sensitivities, the you know selective eating type thing. When the mom would drop her off, this little girl was adventurous. This is the kid at like 11 or 12 years old who came in the second appointment and made fun of me because I gave her a disclaimer in the first time that we met. You know what? By the time we're done, you're going to be more adventurous with trying new foods, though I'll let you know something in advance. There's still going to be some things that you really, really like, and there's still going to be some things that you don't like. So I'll tell you, I consider myself a rather adventurous eater. I like trying new things. I like trying different flavors and spices. And even when I travel internationally, sometimes I'll make it a point to order something that I don't even know what it is to, you know, learn more about the local cuisine. And on top of that, I just don't like mushrooms. You know, it's not even an allergy thing. Uh, it's, I don't even know if it's a texture or a flavor. I just don't care for them. Now, I'm not going to freak out if I see one you know, on, uh, on a meal, I might, if they're big, pick them out and give them to my wife. She loves them. But if they're there, like the other night we ordered a pizza and it was a Supreme pizza and my wife forgot to say mushrooms on half. And I still ate it and wasn't picking them off because they're, you know, it's not a big weird thing to me. I gave her a much shorter version of this, by the way. So at the end of this, you might still have foods that you don't like. This kid goes to a buffet between the first and second appointment. And like Harriet the Spy, which is a very old reference, it turns out. She sits there with a notepad, and she's trying a little bit of everything. And she brought the notepad into the second appointment. And she's there going, I tried um, meatloaf, and I liked it. I tried the steak, and I thought it was too chewy. I tried cooked beets, and I liked those. I tried the pickled beets, and I didn't like those. Oh, I like mushrooms. I'm better at this than you are. This 12-year-old little girl who looked nine, by the way, she's small. She goes, I'm better at this than you are. And just to have fun with it, I kind of joined her. It's like, wow, you really are. That is amazing. So that's what was happening when mom dropped her off. Can you guess where I'm going? When the dad would drop her off, she completely backslid into the problem. And I found out a little bit of the reason why. No matter what was going on, Dad's there going, now I know you're a picky eater. You don't have to eat that if you don't want to. And she'd become timid. She'd become cautious and anxious and just not even try. So this is where oftentimes if I was, when I was working more with kids back in the day, uh, the parents would ask, what can we do to help out? And I kind of tell that story and kind of 
playfully make the joke. So how about you keep out the first week? And they go, that makes a lot of sense. (laughs) And then I'd follow it up with, you know, the easiest thing you can do is start to talk about their solution more than their problem. Stop reminding your kid of the problem that they don't have anymore. And by doing that, you know, this is easiest self-hypnosis right there. Talk about what you want rather than what you don't want. If people did that, they'd all be a lot more happy, a whole lot more successful. So stories, as we're getting at here, stories teach, stories inform. Look what that story satisfies for me, by the way. Let's go a little bit deeper into the influential pieces of the puzzle inside of what happens when I tell the story of the uh, 11-year-old girl making fun of me about liking mushrooms more than I do. She got the result. We also talked about family dynamic in that story. We also talked about the power of creating positive education. Also, I talked about how there's a dash of responsibility inside of what you're about to do, because no matter what magic stuff we do in the session, you're still the one who's going to be out there doing the new thing yourself. So do you see how many different influential points are being hit by talking about that story and reinforcing to the client that they're still an active participant inside of the process? So as much as I can have these little bits of, as we call them now, hypnotic language hacks, magical phrases that really set the power up for what we're about to do, look at what happens when you scan your stories and you can metaphorically lean in to the important parts of the story that now emulate and sort of amplify the points that you really want to share. I go back to getting to know Michael Elner years ago, who did sadly pass away a number of years ago. And Michael was a guy who I'd put into a category, like many others, um, who taught techniques and taught the hell out of those techniques really the ins and outs of a method, the specificity that really took a technique from being good to, I won't even say great, but to absolutely phenomenal. And this is not a but, this is an and. And you got the result because you were in the room with a person who believed in you more than the solid nature of your problem. I bring this up because one of the conversations I had uh, with someone who even is a working hypnotist and was looking at, actually, we've had this several times now, was looking at doing both the Work Smart Hypnosis Live certification event as well as the Train the Trainer event. They were going, I want to create my own courses, but I also want to go through your class too, Jason. So we're having that conversation and here's this person who was already earning their full-time living. And yes, I got permission to tell the story. Uh, And actually said to me something I've heard several times over the years. You know, I've heard your older stories, Jason, about how back in the day you would see upwards of like 20 to 35 clients a week. I'll tell you, I only can handle like one or two appointments a day because people come in with their problems and that just wears you down. And if you out there have ever said something of that nature, I'll tell you what that means. It means you are associating with your client's problem more than you are associating with their solution. And in the words of Bob Newhart, stop it. See your client as the result. Bring them along for the ride. Whether it was in person, whether it's now online, how I do my services primarily now, the moment we connect, even if it's the consult, If I can envision you, if you can see it, if you can describe it, if you can connect with it, it's a whole lot easier to go there, right? So that opportunity to now observe you in the direction you're ready to go, and now it becomes a game of putting the puzzle pieces together in the right way so that old model of living is no longer congruent. And I tell my clients, here's another point towards heart of a teacher, everything that we're about to do leaves behind a trail of techniques and you're going to know how to strengthen everything that we're about to do on your own long after we work together. There's something deeply embedded inside of that statement, by the way, for those of you who are not already rewinding it and writing that down. It's that I've cut a specific word out of my language and my communication with my clients. I do not use the word reinforce. It's not about coming in for a reinforcement session. No, 
all the work is all about sharpening your skills and elevating the results that you're already noticing. So it might be a subsequent appointment, it might be another session, but it's definitely not, in my language, a reinforcement session. It's about sharpening your skills and elevating the results that you're already realizing. So now, again, everything falls into a category of performance enhancement. And again, everything that we're going to do together leaves behind a trail of replicatable techniques, many of which you can do on your own anytime, anywhere, without people even realizing you're doing something. So this doesn't become the game of, I need a dark room and a CD player for an hour. No, it's instead, the moment you become aware of that old signal, instead of being the reason why you found yourself back in the problem again, now it becomes every reason you turn that moment into a strength. Which for those that are curious, the way that I'm communicating with you right now is a lot of what I say to people when they hop onto a consult with me to become my client. I'm running them through, as I call this now, product pacing. I'm running them through the user experience, the philosophy of the change process, and I'll call it out. There are some people this doesn't align with, and I sincerely wish them the best. The overwhelming majority go, this is very different than spending three months talking about a problem and not noticing any outcomes from it, which can be said of many different modalities. That's not a jab of one thing specifically. But it's to kind of come about it from this person who is kind of leading a movement, shifting a dialogue, creating a new way of looking at the world. So it's that there's power. Some of you have seen some of the business education I do inside of hypnotic business systems. The moment we can bring people into a movement, the moment that we can bring people into a new philosophy, we have changed the criteria in terms of how they make the decision. And by then entering into that process, which yes, is a business arrangement where they're paying for a series of appointments and then coming in for their sessions and doing the work of professional hypnotism, by entering into that agreement, they're now agreeing back to the philosophies that I've presented, that I've educated them upon as to a different way of looking at the world. The way that, again, I've got several stories now of someone coming in saying, the reason I have this issue is because, and we flipped the because, that because this is the thing I have to deal with, now it's every reason I don't have to fill in the blank whatever unnecessary habit used to be there. So do you see how, again, it becomes less about hypnotizing your client and more about creating a hypnotic environment where now your client is learning skills, tools, and abilities so I'll kind of tie this all together with a bit of a technique, which no matter where you are right now, if you're in a place that it's okay to close your eyes, feel free to do so. If you're doing some other task that needs your attention, you can continue to give that task your full attention, even though you're aware of the sound of my voice. And take this moment right now and just become fascinated by your breathing. Just become curious about your breathing. Notice that magical place where the inhale turns around on its own and becomes an exhale. That's right. And you know, the greatest thing about bringing your attention to your breathing is that, first of all, you always have your breath with you. As long as you're breathing, technically speaking, you're doing all right. But the reality is, by describing this fascination around your breathing, it brings you into the present moment. Because stress and anger are feelings that deal with the past. Worry and anxiety are feelings that deal with the future. Events that have either already happened and we cannot change, or events that haven't yet happened and might not even happen at all. As you bring your fascination and curiosity to your breathing, it brings you into the present moment where those old, unnecessary, difficult emotions really cannot exist. And by the way, even for those of you listening to me right now, notice that I've not yet once said to breathe slower or deeper. I haven't even told you to relax, but notice you can actually calibrate what's different about this quality of physical experience you're now enjoying versus what it was a few moments ago before I directed you to think about your breathing. And isn't that interesting that the moment you bring your attention to yourself and truly live in 
the moment. You start to notice the world around you as it really is. No longer how it once may have seemed to be. And I wonder, just out of curiosity, what kind of better changes you can produce with your client as you're now working from a mindset of helping your client to become hypnotic rather than, and I make fun of this on purpose, I am the almighty hypnotist and I command thee to change. No. I wonder also what would happen differently as you step into that heart of the teacher, not only in terms of how your clients, but helping to build this next wave of phenomenal practitioners, because the reality is the more we're all successful, the more we're all successful. And while, yes, that was a subtle way to invite you to head over to the show notes at worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash 339 and check out the upcoming Work Smart Hypnosis Live, as well as the Train the Trainer program, I wonder how much more effective you're going to become at so many other parts of life as you yourself step into this reality that, yes, you can live hypnotically. And on this theme of living with the heart of a teacher— what else there is to learn from yourself. Jason Lynette here once again, and as always, thank you so much for leaving your reviews of this program online, sharing it in your ongoing conversations to greater enrich this industry. And one more time, check out worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash 340, 340. That'll bring you over to the show notes of this episode and give you even more details about the upcoming Work Smart Hypnosis Live and online training event, as well as the Train the Trainer program. Again, chances are there's many of you that are ready to take your skills and abilities to an even greater level. And as you approach things from this mindset of the heart of a teacher, this is what better arms our clients. This is what helps to better grow our industry. This is what indeed helps us to help people, and yes, indeed, from a business perspective, make it rain. So check out those details at worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash 340. I'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to the Work Smart Hypnosis podcast at worksmarthypnosis.com. Hey, it's Jason here, and I want you to be the first to find out as we upload new content here online. So do this right now. Click subscribe right next to this video, and you will be the first to find out as I share further resources, further downloads, and other really cool things to come your way. See you soon.